Hello everyone and welcome back to High Desert Growing. I'm Jay Bell and holy cow it has been a hot summer. Now if you've seen my other videos you may understand why your garden struggled this year. In fact when it's 105 degrees outside your regular watering regimen is not going to be enough. You're going to have to increase the amount of water that you would normally give just because they transpirate or breathe moisture out the same way we do when we breathe out of our mouths. So if you were watering according to your usual watering schedule, but you didn't increase the amount of water during the hottest days, that's going to be a major part of the reason why your garden maybe didn't do as well as it could have. Now when our plants struggle in our gardens, that makes them more susceptible to disease and pests. And by far, the pest that I get asked about the most as a master gardener is the squash bug. It's also a request that I've had from you all. So today I'm going to do a quick rundown on the life cycle of a squash bug, how to identify them so you know how they look in all of their life stages. Uh, we'll talk about best management practices. And then I'm going to finish up with uh, an article that I read with hopefully an advancement in our ability to manage pests like squash bugs and stink bugs in the future. Let's get started. Now the squash bug is familiar to just about anyone who's ever grown squash in the Southwest or probably anywhere. And I'm sorry, but I'm going to start by squashing your hopes that there are no fast and easy tricks to getting rid of squash bugs. There's no 100% secret weapon. These guys are insidious, they're determined and they're quick. And in a couple of days, they can bring a healthy plant down to its knees and completely destroy it and destroy your crops. But that doesn't mean that all hope is lost. With some diligence, luck, and best practices, you can increase your chances of a successful harvest. I'll go over the various methods that I've tried over the years, as well as a few that I've heard of that maybe I haven't tried, but have heard from other people that have worked for them. For your part, try a little bit of everything and see what works. But remember that what works one year or for five years may not work next year. So keep these all in your playbook. First, let's identify our foe. This is a squash bug and it's related to the stink bug. Both of them smell terrible when you squish them and don't worry if you get them confused, a lot of people do. The important thing to know is that both are bad for your garden and both should be kill on site. Now the life cycle of the squash bug has three phases, eggs, nymphs, and adults. You'll find the eggs laid on the undersides of leaves tucked into the little V up against the, the spines of the leaf, you know, where the veins actually create a little nook, I guess, if you want to call it that. And sometimes they lay them on the stems themselves, usually on the lower side because they want to hide from predators up above. And they don't just stick to cucurbits either. I found them on my pepper plants before, so keep your eyes peeled. So when you're looking for their eggs, they are actually a reddish brown color and they're grouped in neat rows. And it takes about one to two weeks for the nymphs to hatch. And when they do, they come out a pale green with black antenna and legs. They're kind of pretty, unfortunately. <laughs> More mature nymphs are a pale gray or white color. And if left to their devices, nymphs will grow to adulthood in about four to six weeks. And um, well, one pack of eggs can destroy your crop in a matter of days. Their method is not a whole lot different than a lot of other pests that we find in our trees and our plants. They basically, their mouth parts pierce the membrane on the leaf. They suck out the nutrients in the leaf, which the plant is supposed to be making for itself, for its own survival, its own sugars from photosynthesis, remember biology? And any healthy plant can survive to some extent some predation. But when you have the whole fam damly coming after one plant, it's just not gonna make it. The bugs will also feed on fruit. I've seen them eat my squash. I've seen them eat my zucchini. Um, they typically never have pierced the skin of my pumpkins once they're a little older and tougher. And some varieties will be more resistant to squash bugs than others. And actually, individual plants within one variety sometimes can be more immune than others. So keep your eyes peeled. See which ones really make it and which ones don't. So how do we get rid of them, Jay? That's a complicated question. Once they've found you, it's more of a game of management, not of elimination, especially if you don't want to use pesticides. For small plantings like my backyard, your best method is going to be diligence, um, crop rotation, and mechanical removal, which is basically removal by hand. 
Squash bugs are the most active in the morning, very early morning and the, the late evening. So right as the sun's coming up and going down. Start by watering the plant and wetting all of the leaves. And then get down on eye level with the plant and wait about 60 seconds or so. What you'll notice is you'll see nymphs and adults of the squash bugs climbing up the, the plant and trying to escape the flood that they think is happening in the soil because that's where they take refuge during the day when it's hottest. Now it's time to pick them off. And this is not my favorite part of gardening. I will have to admit that I am the person that wears gloves when I pick these guys off my plants. Uh, I just don't like the way they smell. I have a sensitive nose. And, um, and they're just, they're, I don't know, there's something about picking up a beetle with my bare hands. I will never probably appreciate it. And that's okay, that's fine. If you're one of those brave Bettys who, or Ben's, who likes to go out there and you don't mind picking the bugs off with your hands, go for it. You are braver than I am. What comes next is up to you. Now, a lot of people like to take a bucket of soapy water out or a bowl or whatever, and they just dump their, you know, their finds into the bucket or the bowl in the soapy water and they let them drown there. Um, I personally, I don't want to take the extra step. I don't have a problem with squishing them off to a side somewhere and leaving them. The fact of the matter is, is that uh, wildlife is going to come and clean them up. So for those of you who argue that these are food for the environment, yep, they are. I leave them for the environment to clean up for me. When it comes to the nymphs, they're really tender. They're really easy. Their carapace is very soft. Um, when they're very young, you can really just take your glove or your finger and you can just run it over the run it over the nymph and you'll squash it. You can do it on the leaf and leave it there. It's not a big deal. The goal is to go out and take care of these guys before they get to be too numerous so that they overwhelm your plant. So if you start finding adult squash bugs, it's time to get out there and start hunting as often as possible to get them under control. I myself was outside twice a day this summer and I killed so many squash bugs and I still lost my zucchini plant. But the joke's on me because I didn't rotate my crop. My own fault, it was a dumb mistake. Now that you have the squash bugs themselves out of the way, you're gonna start looking for their eggs. Turn each leaf over, look in all the nooks and crannies, look on the underside of the stems, do your best to make sure you've canvassed the entire plant. And now comes the removal of the eggs themselves. Now, I personally kind of don't have a problem with tearing a piece of the leaf out and just crushing the heck out of that piece of leaf under my shoe. It's kind of cathartic actually, but um, it's, it's easy, you know, not difficult way for me to get rid of them and the plant can handle a little tear in its leaf. It's not a big deal. Some people like to take duct tape and they will wrap it around their hand with the sticky side out and they will use that to press against the leaves where the eggs are and the eggs apparently come straight off onto the tape. I have never tried this. I've just never gotten around to it. I've heard that you can also do this with the younger nymphs. They just stick straight to the tape and you can remove them off of your plant without hurting the plant. Now, there's a couple of growing techniques that you can use to help minimize squash bug presence in your garden. You can grow them on a trellis, like the one that I have here. This one I have beans and cucumbers growing over. Uh, and, you know, if, depending on the type of squash you're growing, if you're growing like a pumpkin, you're going to want to make sure that the pumpkins have some kind of support so they don't, like, tear off of the vine when they get really heavy. But for smaller squash, yeah, it's kind of nice. They just kind of hang down once they get heavy. You know exactly where they are. You don't have to hunt and peck. And um, the squash bugs have a lot further to go from the leaf to the ground and they don't tend to like to get up to those upper branches as much. I've even seen, and I would love to try this sometime down the road when I can figure out how to get the setup going, I've seen squash vines, I guess, grown up a pole. So people basically, you know, tie them off on a pole going straight up. And then as the leaves die off in the bottom, they just let the top ones grow, the, the newest growth, and the squash grows from kind of like a squash tree. It's really cool. I have to try this sometime. Have you guys ever tried that? If you have, please let me know. I would love to see pictures. As for chemical help with squash bugs, my first choice would be diatomaceous earth. The reason being is that it desiccates the bugs. It's not actually a chemical. It's actually, it's like a chemical reaction. It's not poison. Let's just put it that way. Um, desiccation means that it sucks the moisture out of the bugs. They die from lack of water, basically. 
to use diatomaceous earth on your plants, you're going to dust it over the soil closest underneath the plant itself. And in some cases, I know some people that actually dust it over the leaves and the stems. The pro to this is that there's no chemicals, no poisons, nothing to go into the soil that's going to be dangerous. The con, however, is that this doesn't just affect squash bugs. It's going to affect any animal that comes into, into uh, contact with it, you know, bugs, not like cats or dogs. Um, so it's going to, you know, kill earthworms and um, it'll kill bees and stuff like that. So it's not my first choice, but I'm also not using it all around my garden and I don't have a huge um, squash patch. So I'm not as worried about it. I might have something to say if I was using it on a farm scale application. Now, I'm not a farmer. I don't do large scale. Uh, I do read about farming, but uh, this is one thing I don't know. So if you are a farmer and you have input on this, I would love to know how you handle squash bugs in your larger applications. Another option is the trap crop. If you've ever had a cr trap crop, you'll know that sometimes they happen by happy accident or kind of unhappy. It depends on how you see it. I'm a glass half full kind of girl. So, you know, happy accident. But a trap crop is when a pest attacks one plant with so much focus that they miss the other plants that are kind of just like it. And so they leave the other plants alone and, and only focus on that one. And you kind of wind up sacrificing that first plant so that the others can survive. And so these bugs get to eat what they're going to eat and then you still get your harvest on the other side. You know, it's kind of a, you know, you're feeding the environment yay and you're still getting your food you're just not getting as much as you were hoping but anyone who gardens knows that when we garden we have to expect to give a look back to the environment a little bit so you know especially in a year like this we have to be willing to share a little bit more than we would normally like to for this reason i try to make sure that when i rotate my crops i am placing my squash plants not right next to each other, but further apart. So that if one gets attacked, maybe the other one is further away and doesn't get attacked. Now I, on the south side of my house, had my zucchini plant where it got attacked, but I have a winter squash here on the east side of my house and it's doing okay. It also started later. So, you know, it's, it's just, this year it worked, last year it didn't. I, I don't know, there's no perfect answer. I know a lot of people that like to start growing their squash um, after the 4th of July. They swear by it. They swear that if you plant after the 4th of July, the squash bugs will have gone to your neighbor's house instead and found their crops and leave yours alone. Now, I've tried that too, and I still got decimated. So, you know, if it works for you, great. Uh, you know, kind of go into it with an experimental air and the ability to accept it if it just doesn't work out this year. We have a grower's market. Go support your local farmers if you can't grow your own. Um, you know, that's what I wound up doing this year and I'll probably take a year off from squash next year and then start again. So, um, but timing can be another method to help you manage your, your squash success. And this conversation wouldn't be complete if we didn't address mulch. So I've already talked about mulch and how important it is in our desert climate with our sun and our wind and all this craziness. And I, I'm the one that's the first one that's like, mulch, mulch, you crazy person. <laughs> and then you wind up talking about squash bugs. And I have to say, like, there's a little asterisk here. Um, except, except you don't want mulch on top of the soil over the winter if you grew squash there the year before and had squash bugs. Because these squash bugs will overwinter in that mulch and the top layers of soil and uh, come back up the next year ready to go. So removing the mulch doesn't get rid of them necessarily, but it can help to control them. Uh, some claim that it makes all the difference and some don't. I have heard from everyone on every angle and for every solution that I have heard, there is someone who swears it doesn't work and vice versa. So, you know, you talk to a lot of people about gardening and you hear everything. As a side note, I want to make a note that squash bugs don't just focus on squash and pumpkin. They also will eat anything in their, the cucurbit family, which is melons, cucumbers, and squash. So they prefer the squash plants, but if you have a squash plant next to your cucumber plant, 
that infestation is probably going to spread. So keep an eye on that. Pay attention to what's going on um, with your families of plants and where you plant them together. Last on my list of preferable solutions are chemicals and pesticides. And there's a few reasons, which I'm about to cover. Neem oil is the most commonly mentioned that I hear about from people. Uh, it's most effective only on the youngest, the, the nymphs of the squash bugs. I don't know that it does a lot to the adults. Um, it can do, it can help a lot. It absolutely can help a lot. Don't spray it in the middle of the day, spray it in the cooler temperatures. But the, the pro is that it's safe for um, food crops. The con is that you really have to drench the plant. You have to get the tops, the bottoms, the sides. You have to get a full, complete drenching as well as into the top layer of soil near the base of the plant. And that can be really labor intensive. It requires attention for several days at a time. Um, I prefer the diatomaceous earth just because I am a human with, with children to raise and school events and a house to run and you know my job everything i have to do i don't have time to go out there and spray constantly some people find time for it and man bless you for having that that fortitude i don't other more aggressive pesticides are out there but you run the risk of damaging good insect populations the same way as diatomaceous earth but i think even more so um, and also, you know, the bugs that do die, maybe not on top of the plants, they get eaten by birds and then the birds wind up carrying the pesticide and if they eat enough of these, these bugs, now the bird has a whole stomach full of this pesticide and that can be extremely damaging to the bird population. So I really try not to use pesticides for that reason as well. I, I don't want them in my body, I don't want them in my kids' bodies and I don't want them in the wildlife's uh, stomachs either because, you know, they have an important job in the ecosystem. And let's be real. I mean, the reason a lot of us are growing our own gardens, besides the fact that, you know, we really enjoy the, you know, the zen of it all, is that we're trying to grow healthier food for ourselves and our families that don't have the pesticides. And so why would you bring it into your garden? That's just how I see it. And finally, I, I mentioned it briefly before. If you have a squash plant that seems to do particularly well, even though you had squash bugs, like say it had squash bugs and another one next to it had squash bugs and that one died, but the, the other one survived, even though it was being preyed on, save those seeds. Keep those seeds and plant them next year for a couple reasons. The first one is that it will begin to naturalize to the micro environment of your backyard. And secondly, it probably has a natural propensity to repel and survive squash bugs and you want to breed that trait. So if you have that experience, great, keep that. If you have a squash plant that is decimated by squash bugs and you maybe only were able to harvest one squash, don't replant those seeds. Don't perpetuate that, that habit for that plant to be preyed on by, by squash bugs. And finally, as promised, I want to tell you about this cool article that I read. I've actually posted it below, so go ahead and give it a click and, and give it a read. It's pretty neat. The long and short of it is that some of the researchers at an agricultural college figured out through observation that the baby squash bugs, the nymphs, when they hatched, they would make a beeline for the nearest adult squash bug, which would then poop, and then the baby squash bugs would eat that poop. And the reason that they were able to figure it out was that these young squash bugs didn't have a particular um, bacteria in their gut that they needed. Kind of like we have, you know, a, a gut biome. They also have a gut biome and they don't have it naturally when they're born. So they have to get it from the previous generation. So the hope is that what they will be able to develop is some kind of like a sluggo for squash bugs. And what I mean by that, sluggo works by basically you drop little nuggets down that the slugs eat and it fills their stomach and they can't eat. Um, it fills them up so they, they can't eat anymore and they die of starvation. It's kind of, kind of dark, but it, but it works really well for slugs. The idea being that with squash bugs, they would develop a bacterial um, counterfeit that the, the baby nymphs would eat and doesn't provide the benefit that a natural bacteria would have and so these squash bugs also wind up dying of starvation because they can't digest the foods that they need. Now if it does become a reality 
it'll be a great big sigh of relief for those of us who love calabacitas. I'll let you know if I hear anything, if I catch any word of any product being developed. I try to keep my ear down to the ground for anything new that's being thrown out there. And I'll hopefully something in the near future. It'll be great. And that's it. I'm curious to know what your experiences have been. And every time I talk to people on this topic, I always learn something new. That's all for now. Make sure you hit the like and subscribe, and I'll catch you next time. Take it easy, guys.